Do you believe? Alright, let's start with this. This word, simply Bharatanatyam, there's a lot already. What does this word evoke in you? It can be anything, a phrase, a word, <coughs> and any, any association that you have with the word. A like few answers. Yes. Happiness. Okay, nice. Beauty. Very nice. Expression. Traditional. Traditions. Yes. Anything else? Nothing else? Grace. Very nice. Okay, so growing up for me, um, I heard a lot of this one word about the form. From my own peers, as a Gen X woman, I've heard this a lot, and the word is frankly boring. Okay, so I had to hear this growing up, learning the form, started when I was four. And I don't really believe in this. Yes, the form is slow, the form is very traditional, rooted in religion and culture and heritage. Because that is the context that it grew in. But it is so much more. And that is what I wish to bring to you today, the relevance of this art form as a Gen X, right? For me, this art form has been like a river, a vast and perennial that has flown for so many ages and will continue to do so. And it has never stagnated in all these ages and centuries of its history. A very long history it has from the temples where we worship the deities using dance as a form of worship, describing the Lord, the legends of the Lord, the stories of the Lord, all of the mythology we hear of. Moved on to the courts of the patron kings. It became a little bit more scholarly, a scholarly endeavor, a lot more intellectualism that came in. They uh, part with other musicians and poets. Very beautiful interpretations that came out of this era. Finally moved to the stage where it became more accessible to the public as such. And it became a form of entertainment and storytelling. And not only did this happen in different stages of time, these forms of Bharatanatyam also coexisted during the same period of time. It's not just in different stages. And so to me, this is an ancient river, but one that still flows and one that still contributes to, to our society as such. And it will continue to do so as long as we practice it and the form is alive and breathing. With each generation of artists, there is so much more contribution to the art and there is so much evolution. For example, I've heard this a lot again growing up, that Bharatanatyam has a very rigid traditional movement vocabulary, which is simply not true. There are codified movements that you learn in the beginning. Yes, very much. But these two are movements that have come with evolution regarding the context that it grew in. For example, Bharatanatyam vocabulary in the erstwhile Mysore state in Karnataka would be very, very different than how it developed in, say, Tanjavur in Tamil Nadu. You have different deities in the temples, you have different patron kings, you have different languages, you have vastly different cultures. And so the movement vocabulary actually translates to that. And so we see that Bharatanatyam has never been rigidified, solidified and has continued to change according to the society it is a part of. And also, it is a part and reflection of the society it is in. But it is also contributed to the society it is in. So just like a river that adapts to the terrain it flows in, it also changes the terrain it flows into. Right? Every, every dancer Every artist who performs on stage comes with a conviction, comes with a thought. And every thought that any audience member takes away with them changes society in a way, whether that change is immediate or not, whether that change is vast or not, doesn't matter. Even then, there is an exchange of thought, there is an exchange of process that happens, there is a connection that occurs. And so we see today. We perform very traditional items in the margam that have been handed down. Margam being a very set uh, pieces that we have been performing for ages, for centuries, which we've learned from our gurus who learned from their gurus. 
but also various contemporary ideas and concepts that have been explored. So of course, I do pieces about Shiva, Vishnu, Krishna, Rama, Devi, about kings, but also about caste, gender, religion and the environment, things that matter to us, things that we personally care about, right? And here it comes into this very symbiotic relationship between the audience and the artist. As I said, dance does not exist in a void. Even a very traditional art form like Bharatanatyam does not exist in a void. It is a very interactive art form. Okay, And this is where I begin the bit about dance as a therapy. I don't believe uh, in dance as a therapeutic practice as such. Therapy is actually very, it's a very small term. Dance, Indian classical dance especially, is much, much more wholesome. And I hope some of what I experience, because not all of it I think can be said, but I will do my best to explain it in words, can be understood and experienced by all of you today. Simply put, dance is a great way to stay fit. Any of you who have danced any form, for that matter, will agree with me. You get your heart pumping, it's a great form of cardio. You have your blood flowing, you have your sweat dripping, calories burning, you stay active. There's a wide range of motion that occurs when you perform a form like Bharatanatyam itself. Your very basic postures require you to be very flexible and active. Yes? But is it all just that? Is it all just movement and action that we seek out of a practice like this? Why not just dance something like aerobics or Zumba? Why not be done with that? Any ideas regarding why classical dance takes it one step further? Any ideas? It can be anything. There is no right or wrong answer. Please. You're telling a story. Yes, yes. And what do you do when you tell a story? You express, yes, and also, yes, very good. Anything else? Very valid, we'll also come to this. But ultimately, it all boils down to mindfulness. Okay, classical dance as a practice forces you to be mindful and in the moment every single second of the day that you are dancing. And in a day and age where we have multiple distractions and very sedentary lifestyles, we're sitting, we're on our phones, I'm also guilty of that. This is something that really, really forces you to introspect and reflect. There are two aspects to this. One being physical awareness and regulation, right? You become very aware of every part of your body. Most of us are sitting all the times and how many of y'all experience back pain? Do not lie. How many of y'all have bad backs? I did too. Yes. So the problem with our generation is not our own faults to be really honest. It is the way it is and we're not mindful enough of what our body is doing every second of the day. But a practice like this will bring you back and ground you. Our very basic postures, um, would all of you be comfortable with standing and just trying one or two postures with me to understand what I mean by mindfulness? It will take you two seconds I promise and it's not going to give you any pains or aches. <clears throat> so let's do a very basic posture in Bharatanatyam. Those who have trained even a little bit in the form will know this. It is called the Aramandi or the half sitting. Okay, so it's extremely simple. You part your feet, you part your knees and you open your hip out, keep your spine straight and sit. Push your knees out. Nicely push your knees out and sit. Stay and breathe just for a second. Take a deep breath in, take a deep breath out and simply observe. Are you aware of your back? Are you aware of what your back is doing? Are you aware of your hip? Does your hip feel neutral? Is it going backwards? Is it going forwards? Is it straight? 
are your knees parting as much as your feet or are they not parting at all? You know the answers to this, right? All you can sit down. Thank you all so much. Okay, so if you could observe, you are extremely aware of what each muscle that you are engaging is doing because it is a very still form of practice that we just did. And while dancing, even when the dance is rigorous, even when you are continuously moving, because you've learned each step and practiced each step over years and years and years, corrected each dance, perfected each pose, you become highly aware of even the energy that runs through each mudra, to the fingertips, to the neck, what is your neck doing? Is it tilted? Is it doing the famous Bharatanatyam bob? Is your spine straight? Is your spine angled? How much angulation? Where? Which muscles being engaged? How much are you sitting? How much can you sit? What is the range of motion that you can explore? All of these, including the wind hitting your face as you turn, the sweat dripping on your body as you dance, all of this becomes something that you become acutely aware of. But this can also be achieved with a practice such as yoga, maybe coupled with like a little bit of strength training or weight training will have the same effect. You achieve flexibility, strength, agility, range of motion, everything that you seek to achieve from dancing. So again, why dance? Why Indian classical dance, a form like Bharatanatyam in specific? And now we come back to my favorite part of dance, the storytelling. The storytelling is seems simple enough. We hear stories growing up. Stories form a huge crux of our civilization and our history. But something as basic as this makes you mentally and emotionally aware and helps you regulate these emotions. Be extremely mindful of what you're feeling in every second. This is honestly my favorite part about dancing, is storytelling. Because I can stand in this one tiny little circle and I can turn into any character I want. I can transform into any creature I want. I can transport myself as an artist. I can transport hopefully the audience to a different time and place while telling a story. I can become a king. I can become a beggar, I can become even a flower, I can become a tree like most of us were or I can even be a god or a demon exploring a huge range of eternal human emotions. These emotions don't change by the way, all of these emotions that we feel that we are born with something that has been felt for centuries before us and will continue to be felt. And so when you connect with stories from a different age and time, you understand that we are no different. We're individuals who are all connected with each other. And it forces you to empathize. Empathy. Empathy that which connects all of us. Forcing us to understand choices that we would never make as individuals. Forcing us to put ourselves in another person's shoes, another character's shoes another animal's shoes, forcing us to explain their actions no matter how wonderful or terrible they are. For example, uh, I remember this was about a couple of months ago that I learned a new piece, a very old piece. There is a Naika, her beloved, her husband is cheating on her. Okay, and she's a much older woman, I do not relate to her. And she very sarcastically questions him about what he was doing all night and in the end she takes him back and I asked my teacher why why would she do such a thing because I would personally never make that choice and there therein lies the beauty of the art you have to understand you have to empathize with the person that you are not and that is where you stop seeing the world as black and white you start seeing that there is no right and wrong. There are so many different perspectives, so many different viewpoints. Each story has multiple, multiple ways of seeing it. Even if you're playing a villain who's done terrible things, even stories from the Ramayana and Mahabharata, if you're playing a character like Ravana, you're playing a character like Dushasana or Duryodhana, you have to put yourself in that person's shoes. 
understand the nuances behind the choices that they made. And this not only helps you understand another character, but also regulate your own negative emotions, positive or negative. But I have seen personally experience this does help me regulate emotions such as anger, jealousy, or very ugly emotions that we can think of. So you see, dance really, really, whether you want it or not, forces you to be in the moment. Whether you like it or not, forces you to be in the moment. And that's another thing that my guru keeps telling me. He says, observe, observe, observe everything around you. It will help you in your dance somewhere. And I thought, observe what, what exactly? People are people, people do what they want. People are stupid, yes. But then I realized, the divinity of an art form, such as Bharatanatyam, doesn't exist in the fact that it's rooted in religion and tradition. We hear it is almost sacrilegious, almost blasphemous to tamper with it, to change its movement vocabulary, to do anything with it for that matter, to say any word against it for that matter. But that is not where the divinity of the art lies. The divinity of the art lies in its ability to look at everything, even the most mundane of things, a person sitting in the most beautiful way possible. You begin to see the beauty of everything around you simply by observing. Simply by observing, you see the beauty of birth, of death, of joy and laughter, of suffering and misery and tears of the sun, of the wind, of the leaves moving to the wind, of the water flowing. All of this simply by being in the moment. Simply by translating this into a language that uses the entire human body to communicate. So coming back to the point that a form like Bharatanatyam, a traditional form like Bharatanatyam, is not relevant in today's day and age. I find that very absurd. And after having said all of what I've said now, I really hope you find that absurd as well. Because Bharatanatyam, like any other language, simply wishes to express. Take some time to understand the language that you're trying to communicate in. But otherwise, it is the most beautiful form of visual poetry you will ever experience. And with each generation, we are continuously pushing creatively to expand its vocabulary, expand its reach and propagate the art to every generation now and in the future. Coming to my very, very last point. Dance as a tradition. Why come back to this over and over again? Why do the same things over and over again? Because in 20 years of practice, I realized this mindfulness that I just spoke of connected me to my roots, connected me to this very civilization, connected me to our history, to our culture, things that you read about and think, okay, yeah, I know about all of this. But to truly feel that connection, to truly understand emotion is a very beautiful thing. And even without realizing it, you start understanding the very essence of Indian philosophy, which is experiencing life in all of its shades and colors and living life to the very fullest. So thank you so much, all of you, for listening to me today. And I truly hope that the meaning of this word, Bharatanatyam, I speak of Bharatanatyam, can apply to any classical form, has changed just a little bit today. Thank you.